If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open for you. Oh, 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 oh. Be encouraged, cause this day's for you. Don't you let this opportunity pass by. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Wendell Jones here at Changing Your Mind Ministries. It's Bible study time. And so as always, I don't ever want to take you off for of granted. Listen, because I know you have umpteen meat options out there. Everybody's streaming nowadays. And so you can go sit at whatever table you wanted to, but you decided to pull up a chair at this one. And for that, I say thank you. And here's my promise to you. Here's my promise to you. I take this thing so seriously. I'm, I'm never going to try to come before you with something half-hearted something that I have poured myself into. And I am excited about uh, the continuation of the series that we are in entitled Character. Character, character, character. We're learning so much about character. And and what we're going to do is break down Sunday's message. And Sunday's message was entitled, Just Tell Me the Truth. But before we get into this, we're going to go ahead and pray. And then we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to take us deeper into some understanding father we thank you so much so much so much and we invoke your presence we invoke your spirit uh just to dominate this time that we have together holy spirit i yield my will my preferences my desire my intellect all of that to you you supersede me absolutely right now and so i'm following your lead uh thank you for the notes you've given me thank you for the understanding you've given me but i tell you holy spirit it is such an exciting thing when you give me fresh revelation in the moment. So my ear is inclined to you. And I'm telling you that because I need you. I need you. I need you. I need your presence on full throttle right now because I understand the the importance of this message, the importance of this understanding, the importance of us exposing uh, a tactic of the enemy, but also making more clear the power of God being greater than anything that Satan has used to bind us. We are going to find a way to be even more free tonight after hearing this. Holy Spirit, help us to hear and to apply. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good friends, listen. Let's go ahead and share tonight. And even as you're listening, please, let's be active in the chat box. I love to hear what you guys are talking about. Um, and, I, and I'm excited about, I, I, I get so excited when I go back and take a look at the chat. But I also want you to go ahead and put the names of your loved ones and your friends um, in the comment section so they will be inclined to come and be a part of us. And um, I'm going to reach back here and do some housekeeping <laughs> and close my cabinet. Uh, I don't want there to be any distractions, uh, but I want you to have I, I, I want to have your undivided attention for this because it's, it's, I, I think it's some good stuff. All right, listen, we came out of the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter, and we read verses 31 and 32, and then we jumped down to verses 43 and 44. And so it says this, so Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jumping down to verse 43. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are your father. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies just tell me the truth that's what god is this is a this is this is a statement that i'm telling you that god is saying to you and me now over these last few sundays and over these last few wednesdays we have been learning how the strength of your character allows God to open doors for you. Please get that. The strength of your character allows God to open doors for you and give you the favor among men that he wants to give to you. 
God wants you to be favored in the society. God wants to be able to use you mightily. God wants to be able to trust you to go into different places and deal with different people. But that is contingent upon the strength of your character, the strength of your character. Now, Let's do a quick recap because I want to make sure we're on the same page. And I don't want to make any assumptions because we might have some new friends to join us tonight. So let me first remind you uh, of what character really is. Listen, character refers to the impressions that you leave on the hearts of people, the impressions that you leave on the hearts of people, especially, especially those people that God has sent to bless you. I need you to hear that. Character are the impressions that you place, that you leave on the hearts of people. You do that for everybody. But let's ratchet it up a little bit, especially those people that God has sent to bless you. And I promise you, I'm going to stop moving this camera. Um, that matters. That matters. Now, now I think I kind of took for granted uh, I may have taken for granted the word impressions because I want you to get a full understanding of what I mean when I say the impressions that you leave on the hearts of people. The impressions can be best understood like this. Listen to this. Impressions represent how we treat people. The way that we treat people affects how they see things. That's what the impressions on people do. The way that we treat people affects how they see things. When we make good impressions on people, these good impressions create good memories, good thoughts. And once people have these good memories, these good interactions, these good thoughts that we leave with them, people have a tendency to see the good in life. They have a tendency to see the good in themselves because we have left good impressions on them. But the converse of that is true also. When we make bad impressions on people, people have a tendency to see the, see the world, their, their life and the world outside of them, they see only the bad in it. And they see only the limitations that they have. So truth be told, your possibilities have, pro have, have been limited based on the bad impressions that people have made, family have made, fam friends have made on your life, it causes you to look at the world in a skewed way and you don't see all of the goodness, you don't see all of the possibilities, you don't see all of the opportunities. You have developed this, 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 this notion of where I, I focus and fixate on the bad in life and I overlook all of the good. And that's because of the bad impressions that have been made on you. But those who have been been impressed upon in a good way have a tendency to be able to find the good in life. They see problems as opportunities. They don't believe that life is bigger than they are. So they don't place a whole bunch of limitations on themselves. They believe that they can learn, that they can grow, that they can excel. They believe uh, uh, in the possibilities of dreams. So they give themselves the right to dream. When you've had a ton of bad impressions, you stop allowing yourself to dream and you start being a reactionary to life. Because whatever comes up to me, I'll just try to handle it when it comes. But when you have been impressed upon in a good way, you begin to see that life is affording me many things, many opportunities to take advantage of. What just popped in my, 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 my head was a, a saying of Frederick Douglass. Uh, uh, and I, I'm, I know I'm going to screw it up, but I, I'll paraphrase it. Um, he talks about uh, how better, how much better it is uh, to for us to, to 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 raise a healthy child than it is to repair a broken adult. And what he's saying about that is that the older we get, if we've gone through life and life has broken us, it has made bad impressions upon us. One of the qualities, the characteristics of those impressions is that those impressions are hard to remove. And so if you get to a broken adult, he or she has impressions, memories, uh, recall of bad events, memories, yeah, memories 
that causes them to look at the world in a bad way, look at themselves in a bad way, look at opportunities, look at you in a bad way because of how others have marked them. And it's easier for us to try to cultivate a world that allows a child to grow up healthy than this for us to cultivate uh, the rehabilitation of adults who's gone through series of bad marks after series of bad marks. I hope that's making sense to you. And so I need you to understand that this absolutely matters to God. The kind of marks that we have left on people and it matters to God, the marks that have been left on you. And I need you to understand that because, listen, our ultimate, the ultimate responsibility that you and, ha you and I have in the earth that we call callings and what have you and visions, and all of those can fall under one category, to be honest with you. And that one category is this, is that we have all been called to assist God in the development of people. We have all been called to assist God in the development of people. We do that in a variety of ways. Right now, I'm doing it as a pastor. I also do it as a leadership and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial coach. I did, I've done, I'm continuing to do it as a father. I do it as a friend. And so my interaction with folks, especially if I'm intentional with this knowledge, is that I want to leave good marks on you because I've been called to help you develop in a good way in a way that's agreeable to what God is saying about you. And we've been called to do that. And so it should start to click now that if we have a tendency to leave bad marks on people, we are now working in reverse. We are working against what God intended for us to do, which was to help people move in a positive direction, move in the direction that God has called them to. But bad marks, bad experiences with us, we have people questioning their ability to even obey God. People can be so damaged that the damage causes them to look at God in a poor light. But he's called us to help develop. And there's a there's, there's word for that. That's not just opinion. And I'm going to give you the word that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. That's over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 11th through the 12th verse. You know this, don't you? It says he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and some as teachers that teacher things should cover all of us nobody escapes this he gave us teachers watch this for the equipping of the saints for the developing of the saints the equipping of the saints for the work of service watch this to the building up of the body of christ we have been called to build each other up we've been called to equip each other that means we have to be intentional about leaving good impressions on people. It can no longer be acceptable that I burn situations down and just move on to the next set of people because I am now working backwards. I am working against the will of God. My character is damaging people. Now, hope that's understandable. Now, if you recall, when, when, I, when I first spoke about character, I said this. I said, we are learning how the strength of your character allows God to open doors for you. I need to now explain what I mean by that, now that you know what character means. The strength of your character, what I'm referring to with that is, listen, in simplest of terms, it is how long we can go before we start making bad impressions on people. See, most of us know how to treat people right in the beginning. Most of us know how to be a contributor, a blessing, somebody positive in the lives of people, especially when we realize that this person has been sent to bless me, especially when we've already received goodness from this person. We have we have we have an overriding tendency. That I, want, I really do want to be good to you. And I think that's the peeking out of that God DNA in us, because we have really been designed to be good to one another. That's what God calls agape love, a benevolent, a benevolent love, meaning that I have been pre-wired to want to do good by you. But my problem is this. I got sin in here, too. And that sin makes me selfish, makes me self-centered, makes me do do all these different things that won't allow me to be good to you because I'm somehow thinking I got to protect me. But still, I got that God DNA that pops through that allows me to be good to you when we first meet. But what I want to be clear is that uh, uh, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Then there's a breaking point where the impressions that I'm leaving on the people, particularly those people that have been blessing me, 
breaks off. And from that line of demarcation, from that line right there, I start to leave bad impressions. What causes that breaking point is what you need to be concerned about. And here it is. What causes that breaking point is when something shows up in your life that hits a place in you that has not been healed. When life begins to demand from you to be able to respond in a place that's broken, a place that's healed, our tendency is to now take that out. When we don't know what to do, our tendency is to begin to take that out on people who are closest to us, people who have been good to us, people who have helped us along the way, helped us to grow. And we start to damage those folks. Man, I could stay there all day and talk about just the ripple effects of that. Imagine, imagine you damaging a person who, who has a history of blessing you. You're not only hurting their ability to keep blessing you, you're hurting their ability to bless other people because you're leaving marks on them that could cause them to withdraw, cause them to second guess themselves, cause them to second guess whether or not they're truly a contributor. Because sometimes it's hard to wrap your brain around the idea of how can somebody I've been good to now turn around and mistreat me. I can send you down this rabbit hole of questions that you begin to ask yourself where you begin to build up self-doubt and begin to attack your own self-worth because somebody has just turned on you. But I need you to get this because wherever I have a tendency to turn on people, it is notifying me that I have now hit my place that I need to take to God because I'm not healed. If I cannot handle life, if I've reached a place where certain aspects of life I can't handle, certain opportunities of life I feel like I can't handle and I'm lashing out, I need to be healed there. Because if not, I'm going to do more than walk away from the opportunity. I'm going to lash out and leave marks on people that are good to me. And then I'm going to set off a ripple effect of bad marks and people playing smaller. I want to be that person God can use. And so what happens is God can use me up unto my breaking point. But his desire is to use me way beyond it. And I got to heal. Now, today's lesson, that's our background. Today's lesson wants you to focus on a tool that the enemy uses, that he hands to us to use to cause damage or leave bad marks on people when we've hit our breaking point. And that most effective tool is called a lie. He uses lies, listen, to further damage the liar, and he uses lies to damage the person being lied upon. He uses lies to further damage the character of the liar. And if you recall from previous lessons, we say all of your life sits on, the weight of your life sits on the strength of your character. And if your character crumbles, you want people to handle the weight of your life. But he also uses you as a liar to damage the character of the person you lie on. And if you get that, you can see how we begin to move backwards. Let's expose this tactic. All right. In verse 32, Jesus is talking to uh, some newly converted followers. The scriptures point out that they were Jews because the Jews were opposing uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ initially. And the best way to oppose somebody, one of the most effective ways to oppose somebody is to lie on them. Or as also known as character assassination. But Jesus is talking to these new converts and he's trying to help. And, And whenever Jesus is talking to us, he's trying to heal us. And whatever subject matter he brings up, he's pointing out a place in you that leaves you vulnerable to the enemy to be used. 
And so he's talking to this group and he's saying, I need to talk to y'all about the truth, the power of the truth. He said, I need to talk to you about part of my own characteristic because he says, when he describes himself, he says, I am the way and the truth. I am truth. And the lie. he said that. And so he's trying to let them know ah, what comes out of the truth. In this text, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Uh, here comes the broken record part, but I got to drill it into you. That word truth means reality. Reality. He's saying to the Jews, these, this group of Jews, as well as to you and I, he says, and you shall know your reality. No means to be intimately familiar. You shall be intimately familiar with your reality, what's really going on with you. He's saying, stop lying about your situation. You shall know reality, your reality. And that knowing of your reality will begin to make you free. In other words, the starting point of your healing is you telling the truth about where you are. God wants that kind of relationship with you, that you're always telling him the truth. God wants you to be so comfortable and consistent in that kind of relationship with him that you begin to gauge the quality of your earthly relationships That, in terms of I, I, I begin to gauge how close you can be to me based on how you, how, how you can handle my truth. That I can trust you with my truth because scripture says, unless I can tell you my business, I can't call you friend. Jesus says, I not call you friend because I can tell you my business. If I can't tell you my business, if I can't tell you my truth, you don't deserve the title friend. You're an associate of mine, but the friend can handle my truth. But that friend also takes my truth and begins to make marks upon me that moves me in the right direction. Reacts to me, responds to me, handles me in a way that 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 allows me to maneuver and navigate through my truth and get to a better place. And so Jesus is telling them and telling us, if you can't tell the truth, I can't help you. If you can't tell the truth. And see, again, God already knows the truth. But God needs you to confess the truth so that y'all are on the same page because there's another principle at play here that says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? I got to tell God the truth so he can walk with me and walk me up out of this. I got to tell the Holy Spirit the truth because scripture calls him uh, uh, the paraclete, which means the one who walks alongside of me. He's designed to walk alongside of me. And scripture also goes on to say, and he leads us into all truth. Holy Spirit's conversation is about truth. It's not about a lie. He said, you got to tell me the truth because guess what? God needs you to understand something about him concerning you and that is this your reality isn't bigger than him your truth can't stop him your truth cannot overwhelm him your truth cannot make God throw up his hands and walk away he already knows the truth about you he just needs you to admit it so that y'all can begin to have and having a conversation about where you really are Am I making sense to you? I hope you're getting that. He says, I need to have a conversation with you about where you really are. But you got to tell me the truth. I hope I'm making sense. And see, if you tell God the truth, I don't want to overwhelm you with information, but 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 if, if, if you tell God the truth, God has this. This, this 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 new motivation because of what took place at Calvary. And this new motivation is called grace. Grace motivates God it, to meet you where you are. Grace means God's willingness to come into my situation. See, in the Old Testament, God said, declare, I'm holy. So I can't come and get in all, all of that stuff you're dealing with. But when Christ died for us and allowed us to now be covered by Christ, God has offered us grace, meaning I'll show up wherever you are, but you got to tell me the truth. I will meet you there. I will meet you there. Not only, listen to this, and, and, and I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. Not only will God meet you there. God tells us way back in the Old Testament, it says, you know, before I placed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. That word knew means uh, I've already experienced your life. God is saying this to you and me. 
look, listen how wonderful this is. I've already experienced your life to the point that I've gone ahead of you and placed provisions in the pathway of your real life, your reality. Your reality is loaded with gifts, provisions, open doors, assistance, relationships, all of these things that God has orchestrated to keep you moving. But if you come out of reality and step into this fictitious world that you create, you're going to miss what God has planted for you in reality. Paul said it like this, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered to the hearts of men what the Lord has prepared for them who love him. God has already gone ahead of you. But if you get off this path that's real and entertain this path of lies, this fictitious world that the enemy has created, you're going to miss healing, miss deliverance, miss the opportunities that God has already prepared for you. And see, Satan wants you consumed with lies. The lies that you tell yourself. Because you pull yourself out of reality. And God is operating in what's real. Because what's real represents the world God made. Because we were made in God's image, we are creators too. And so you can literally create a world of your own based on the lies that you tell. But the sad part about it is that only you are there. All of the provisions are over in the world that God made. Man, I hope I'm making sense. I hope I'm making sense. Because listen, when, when you lie to yourself, you know, your 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 perception, they say perception is reality. That simply means that I have the ability to create my own world and believe that what I say is true. And it does not even have to match the real world. But the problem with that is that everything that's going on in the real world moves right along past me. And so I create this fictitious stuff. Let me give you a more practical example. Have you ever had somebody that made up a fight with you? <laughs> I, I can speak to that because I have to. I, I, Unfortunately, it seems like I got to deal with that way more than I want to. Where, where, where something happens that 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 maybe maybe I've done, maybe I'm guilty of doing, maybe maybe something I've said uh, uh, was misinterpreted, and I can say misinterpreted because I am not out to intentionally hurt people. But sometimes in my teaching and 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 and, and some of my unrefined approaches to things, I may mess around and hit somebody's tender spot. Somebody's spot that's not healed, healed yet. And you know that if you ever hurt physically and somebody bumps into it, your reaction is not a good reaction. Even if it's from somebody that you love, your grandma can bump into your bruised ribs and you like grandma, you, you ready to flex on her. And so sometimes we can stumble across something and hit something unintentionally uh, that's broken in somebody and they're not equipped to deal with it. And like I told you, is that when they're not equipped to deal with it, they lash out at the people that has been blessing them. And so they will end up creating this fictitious battle. They can convince themselves that they now have beef with me and that I have beef with them. And it becomes real. Once they decide that I've got beef with them, everything I say is a jab. Everything I post is a jab. Even though I'm not even thinking about them at whatsoever. But in the world that they've made up, which is now based on a lie, it becomes their reality and they act like it's true. And it begins to sever the relationship, sever our ability to help each other. And Satan loves it. Because that severing may be the very relationship God, well, if, if they've been blessing you, it is the relationship God put together to bless you. And so if the enemy can create this fictitious battle between you, one that's not rooted in truth or rooted in misperception uh, or that's a fancy word for lies. And now we can't help each other anymore. Because two can't walk together because we don't agree. I'm over in the real world, you're over in the world that you made. And oftentimes this person that's over in the world that they made gets angry and angry because nobody is acknowledging the world that they made. Because it ain't real to us out here. We don't see what you see. Because we didn't, what you thought you saw that initiated this was not real. So Satan wants you to live in a world of lies so that you miss out on the goodness of God 
who is over here in the real world trying to show you through his blessings, his instructions, his people, that your life is not bigger than him. And your life is not bigger than his provisions for you. He said, I got you, but you got to stay in the real world. And so people who have a tendency to be to live in denial, listen to this. People who have a tendency to live in denial also have a tendency to lie. I've got to support the denial that I'm living, the world of denial that I'm living in. And it is supported by lies. Truth shatters that world. And so when Jesus shows up as truth, he says, I'm showing up to shatter this false world that the enemy has, has caused you to create based on lies. Uh, John 1 says, he, comes up, he shows up with grace and truth. Grace says, I'm willing to come into your space. Truth says, but I'm going to tell you the truth because we got to destroy the world that you and the enemy have made based on lies. This is not true. This, it is not true that you cannot do all things. The truth is you can do all things. It is not true uh, that you're beneath. The truth is that you are above and not beneath. The truth is that you, it's, not, it's not the truth that you're forever a perpetual borrower. The real truth is that you are a lender. You really are a lender and not a borrower. And so there's a clashing of these things. That begins to reveal that I have been living under the unctions of a lie. But I've actually created a world because I have the ability like God to create. And so I've created my own world based off this lie. And then Jesus shows up. He says, I need, I need to shatter all of that. In fact, I need you to be born again. I hope I'm making sense to you. And so listen, when you are lying on others. You know, before I get to that, so all I just described is what happens when you accept the lies about you. Jesus comes to shatter that. Now, what if you find yourself in the, in the place where because of your brokenness, you're now deciding to lie on people. That don't act like you never lied on somebody. Because you lie because you feel like I can't handle my reality. For me to tell the truth in this situation is too much. Uh, uh, for me to handle the dysfunction of this relationship or the or the or, or, or the dis dysfunction that I've imposed upon the relationship, I can't handle that. So I'm gonna go lie on you and act like it was your fault that the relationship fell apart. I, I'm, I'm a lie on you because I, I I I'm not ready to deal with the truth because it's 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 putting this finger in a place of that's 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 injured in me. And so now you become the liar. And so in becoming the liar, guess what you're doing in reference to character? You now are attacking somebody else's character. How do you do that? When you lie on somebody, you lie on them to somebody else, right? You're telling somebody, you're telling some third party to lie. What you're trying to effectively do is make impressions on the third party's heart about the person you're lying on. So that when the third party meets a person or has an opportunity to interact with a person, they already have this preconceived notion of who they really are. They're already guarded against the person because you've already told them that they don't handle relationships well, that they mishandled you. And so they show up with suspicion. They show up with iniquity, which is suspicion. And when they show up to meet this person who God has been using to bless people, this third party can't even get blessed because they see you in a different light. Because they receive the impressions from the liar. The liar has lied on you to them. And so now them can't see you as you are. Does that make sense to you? And now it begins to reduce your effectiveness in being able to minister to somebody. Because somebody has already attacked your character. But here's the thing that the liar has to realize is that that behavior puts you in a bad situation when you start to lie on people. It literally puts you at odds with God. It literally puts you at odds with God. Watch this. If we go back to, to verse 43 and 44, Jesus is telling them why you have difficulty. Listen to me. Why you have difficulty dealing with the truth. He says, why do you not understand what I'm saying? I understand means to get in the middle of. Why aren't you willing to get in the middle of what I'm saying? Why, why aren't you willing to be consumed by the truth? He said, it's because you can't hear me. You don't want to listen to what I'm saying because it's contradicting the lie that you've been perpetuating. To receive the truth, I've got to expose the lie. I'm not, I can't just get rid of the lie. I've got to expose the lie. That's why, you know, when, when we have 
really done people wrong, the Holy Spirit begins to convict you. Go tell the truth. Go tell them that you lied on them. Go fix it. Go make it right. And we'll go, nah, nah, I'm just going to move on and build another world because I can't, I cannot handle, I don't believe I can handle that reality. I can't handle the reality going back to the people I've lied to and say, listen, I, that wasn't true what I said about so-and-so. So instead of dealing with that reality, I miss out on the blessing that God has placed in that reality. And now I'm living a subpar life because I'm avoiding the truth. And avoiding being a purveyor of the truth. Satan loves that. He wants you to miss every opportunity God has. You. He wants you to believe that you're not strong enough to handle reality, even reality that you have messed up royally. God tells you to go fix it with your brother and sister. Why? He said, because listen, I got a blessing over in there. I got a blessing for you in there. It may not be the restoration, full restoration of the relationship, but it may be just revelation of some knowledge that you need to have that will help you for the next leg of your journey. God says, I got something for you, but you cannot live and perpetuate the lie. But Satan wants you to do that. And so verse 44 goes on and says, let me let me tell you why. Jesus said, he said, because you are of your father, the devil, of, meaning a product of. You are a product. You are an outpouring. You are an example of. Uh, you are a child. Uh, whenever you operate in lies and traffic lies and promote lies, you have now left God and now you're working on behalf of his enemy. And so now you also want the desires of your father. That's what the text goes on. The desires of, the, of, of Satan is to kill, steal and destroy. Lies are set out to do that. Kills, kill the victim's influence, kill their voice, kill the image that God has been developing upon them all these years. It's amazing how God can take years to try to develop somebody into a useful tool and somebody can work to try to destroy that in the minds of others in just a matter of seconds by telling a lie on them. I see it all the time. I live it. You've lived it. I've lived it. You lived it. And so when you agree to be a liar, you are at odds with God. Let me give you scripture for that, too, just to kind of seal it for you. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole text. I'm going to read the beginning of it because that nails it. Proverbs 6, 16 through 17. And it said, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. First thing he says, haughty eyes. And second thing he talks about is a lying tongue. We, we magnify so many different sins. But the book tells you the ones God hate. And, and 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 at the top of the list, near the top of the list, not as if they're spoken in ranking, but the second thing God speaks to is a lying tongue. I hate a lying tongue. Because if you listen to everything I said up to this point, you see how much of how much damage a lie does. God is over in reality. And he's saying, whatever you, however badly you've messed it up, he said, I'm God of that. I can fix that. Your reality is not bigger than you, but you won't be healed until you go stand in your reality. And God is saying this, I'll stand with you. If you are a believer, I've got the Holy Ghost in me and walking alongside of me all at the same time, leading me where? To truth. He says, we got to we got to get to the truth so we can get to healing. I got to tell you what the truth is so you don't keep uh, re-injuring yourself with this with this lie you're telling yourself. And so you don't keep re-injuring other people, injuring other new people, re-injuring old people because of the lie that you're, you're perpetuating. He said, if you're going to be in this will, you got to go back and go, I lied. I got to come out of this. I got to come out of this. I've, I've, I've experienced, and I'm sure you've experienced, people who have done those things to me, and they come and try to make private amends. You know, they, they, they've lied to, to multiples of people, but want to fix it by just talking to you privately. Granted, that, that, that can put your, your heart at ease just a little bit because they, they, they admit I, I did you wrong, but then the damage that's out there still perpetuates. And if we're going to live in our reality, you got to go deal with that too. He's like, I don't know if I can go back and tell everybody. That's you saying, I don't think me and you, God, are big enough to handle my reality. God says, the devil is a lie. I'm enough for you to go fix that and put you back in a useful place for God. If Satan can get you to live in a world of lies, 
He can use you to damage the hearts of others, causing them to live in these untrue limitations because they begin to look at themselves through your eyes. But he also causes damage to you because you are tearing up your own character, tearing up the impressions you're making on others, and it places you at odds with God making you less useful in the kingdom. And so that line, I said, we're good and good and good and good up to this breaking point. When we start trafficking in lies, the breaking point starts to retract, making your usefulness less and less. God says, repent. Let's tell the truth. Let's live in the truth. Tell God you messed up. Tell God the truth about how you feel about it. God, I don't know if I can handle that. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can walk into this. I don't know if I can go fix this. And God is saying, we can together. I just needed you to tell me the truth. When Jesus was asking the father of the son of the little boy that kept throwing himself in the fires, he said, do you believe? And he said, yeah, I believe. But then he said something I think was powerful. He said, but help my unbelief. He said, there are some things I believe, but then there's some places I struggle. Help me in the places that I struggle because I love my son so much. I don't want the places of my struggle to shortchange my son. Oh, that's power. I love my son so much that I have some unbelief that might be preventing him from being healed, preventing him. It may, I might be creating a ripple effect in my family that's damaging my son. And when love kicks in, you go, hmm. I believe up to this point, but after this point, I fall off. Help me at my fall off point, Jesus. Heal me here so that I'm not in the way of my family. I'm not in the way of my friends. I'm not in the way of those assigned to me. I need to go beyond my break off. I need to go beyond my breaking point. I need my character to be strengthened, to be lengthened, that it goes further than it used to because I can't keep falling apart when these certain things happen in my life. I can't keep being that predictable to the enemy that whenever God is blessing me, using me, all he has to do is create the same scenario in my life again because he knows I'm going to fold. He knows I'm going to mess it all up. I'm going to burn it all down whenever he hits me in this place that I have not yielded up to God and allow God to heal. I'm saying this because my character needs to be strengthened in these areas I fall apart. Your character needs to be strengthened in these areas that you fall apart so you can stop being a predictable victim. I will not be victimized at this area anymore. And so God heal me here. So when the enemy circles back around and tries this against me again because he thinks I'm going to fall apart, he will run into a place that's been that's been established, that's been solid, that made, made a firm foundation with the truth of God. And so you can't cripple me with a lie against Satan because I know the truth now. You're going to have to try to find my next breaking point. And guess what? When you expose my next breaking point, instead of me falling apart, I now have a new pattern that when it's revealed to me, I'm running to God. Because I can't afford for it to fall apart and I will not take out my pain on other people. I'm taking my pain to you, God. And I need answers. I need word. I need the intervention of the Holy Spirit. I need you to reveal to me what you've already placed in me. That's going to that's going to enable me to get beyond my broken place. <sighs> I could keep going, but I think I've made my point for tonight. We're about 43 minutes in and I don't like to keep you for very, very long. And so ah, do I even have my takeaway in front of me? I'm looking for it. I may not have put it out there. Yeah, I got it. Here it is. Here's the takeaway from this lesson. And it says this, the lie is both destructive to the person telling the lie and the person being lied on. This works against God's plan for us to assist him in people development. Ultimately, we will be blessed in the earth based on how well we help God develop people. And we will be rewarded in heaven based on the same. We can no longer let me pause there, meaning you're not going to have when you when you get good at helping people to move in the right direction and you leave the good marks, leave good marks on people. You will be rewarded now in the earth. It's set up that way. But also heaven is recording what you're doing. And when you stand before God after you die, it's appointed to every man to die and then the judgment. When you stand before God and God is assessing the value of your life, the value of your life will be determined how how will you improve the lives of.
man, I, that makes me want to talk to you about kings and commonwealth because a king was judged based on how he creates commonwealth, meaning how, how much he makes wealth, value, increase, common to the people connected to him, meaning that a king is, 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 is graded by how much he improved the lives of those around him. And at the end of this thing, Jesus is going to return, returning as the king of kings. He's trying to make us king. Everybody wants to call themselves a king and a queen nowadays. We need to start asking. And, and, and I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm not talking bad about it. But here's the thing you need to ask. Are you improving the lives of the people around? If not, you're not a queen. If not, you're not a king. Because they were obsessed with common will. All right. And the last line says, we can no longer afford to allow our unhealed characters to damage our brothers, our sisters, and ourselves. We will live in truth, we will live in reality, and we will win. We will. All right. Thank y'all. CYM, I told you to come back tonight because I, I felt like I didn't didn't do this justice on Sunday. I think I might have been a little overwhelmed with the with the tributes and all the things that we had going on. And also I felt a little rushed because I, I, I'm conscious of the time. But tonight I got to tell you really my heart on this. So I hope you heard it. Man, if you did, share this thing with somebody because they need to get it. They need to get it. We we need to get it. Imagine how life would be when we realize I can handle whatever comes up. Me and God can. I can't by myself, but me and God can handle tackle anything that shows up. And if it feels like it's too much for me, it's just telling me I'm, I need to be healed there. And God is my healer. Hey, before we go, as always, here's the most important part, salvation. If you watch tonight, I hope you did, and you have not accepted Christ, this is your moment. This is your moment. God wants you just like you are. You ain't got to fix a thing. All you got to do is fix your mouth to repeat after me. It's that simple. Come on, say this prayer with me. Say, Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And according to your word, that is the truth. By my confession, and by my faith, I am now considered righteous and saved. Instantly, God, I belong to you and you belong to me. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. Lead me into truth. Expose all the lies I've been living. And God, I will help you make the lives of others better. In Jesus' name, amen. You said that I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, and I'm so grateful for you because your healed self is going to be a great contributor to this whole life. You that are watching tonight and you gave your life to Christ, here's the thing. You may you may be the, the person I've been waiting on. So I'm excited to see what God reveals about you when he starts to tell you the truth about how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. You're about to discover the real deal that's inside of you, and I'm excited. Let us help you with that. You can connect with us. Send me an email at info at wearecym.org, info at wearecym.org. If you are in driving distance of us, come join us. We're back in person at 1015 every Sunday. Come worship with us. Come learn with us. Come grow with us. Come be contributors with us. We'd love to have you. If you're not in the in, in driving distance from us, hey, stream with us on Sunday mornings and continue to stream with us on Wednesday night so we can continue to grow together. Thank you so much. Hey, before we go, do me a favor. We're going to ask you to bless this ministry. Bless this ministry with your giving. Don't sign off. Don't click off. If it was good to you, if you're making comments, you're taking notes, that means it was good to you. And so, and, and it was relevant to your life. If it was relevant to your life, the appropriate thing to do is to sow back into it. We're not asking for a certain amount of money. Whatever's on your heart, we're not going to beg and plead and run gimmicks. Just pour into the ministry so the ministry can continue to pour into you. You can go to our website at, at wearecym.org forward slash give. We're also found on the GiveLify app. Look up Changing Your Mind in Greenville, South Carolina, because uh, there's another one out there I discovered somewhere in the country. So look up the one that's in Greenville. We have a cash app, dollar sign we are CYM. Uh, you can mail it to us at 9 Beth Drive. Greenville, South Carolina, 29609. And if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and click that donate button and they'll send it over to us. 
Guys, thank you. Thank you for the hearts that you sent out tonight. Uh, thank you for the love you sent to us. Thank you for your prayers for me. I really appreciate it. I'm out here trying to make the enemy mad, and this, I'm, so, I'm seeing that he's upset. Because we're, we're trying to give you truth, and we're going to continue to give you truth so you can get to life. Are you ready for life? Then come on. Come on, walk with us as we grow together. You have an open invitation to come hang out with us. All right. Till next time, much love.